Happy birthday, Westport League of Women Voters. It's 60 years and still going strong. I first joined the League 51 years ago. Uh, I met Alma Fay at, at the Laundrette at West Branch, which is uh, now, I don't know, what near Save the Children. And I knew the League of Women Voters was a good organization because a friend of mine in college said you should always support the League of Women Voters. And so she was maybe the president or vice president, and that's how I came to join in 1958. And um, I was working full time in Fairfield. My office had moved from New York to Fairfield. And uh, I wasn't very active, and then I became pregnant and quit work and became active in the league and was absolutely flabbergasted by all these brilliant women doing all these wonderful things for the town, studying state items, studying the national, uh, what was going on in government. and. Um, Ellen Goldwater was the president when I joined, and uh, Irene Bakalenik was vice president of PR, and she roped me into doing PR with her, and I felt like a complete neophyte. I was probably about 26 years old, and I just, I just was flabbergasted and so thrilled to be among all these bright women. So I continued as a member, and uh, <clears throat> my neighbor uh, joined. Uh, when Victoria Lane went in, Carol Agat moved back there, and she joined. She became the treasurer under Barlow Watton, who was president. And every time somebody moved into Victoria Lane, Carol immediately nabbed them to join the League of Women Voters. So Laurie Boynton joined. Um, another neighbor who has since moved away, Audrey Quello, who still lives back there, and. Um, we were all very active and one of the reasons why we loved the league is we all had small children and they had babysitters while you went to the league meetings there was a babysitter for 50 cents an hour so we would bring these one-year-olds toddlers whatever they usually babysat them in the basement of the Saugatuck Congregational Church and our meetings were elsewhere and then Carol was just a force in the league um, she started Know Your Town. She typed that entire booklet on her electric typewriter in her kitchen. Um, <clears throat> then uh, I was asked to become bulletin editor when Barlow Watton was president, uh, Dee Dee Line was first vice president, and I can't remember all the board members, but Barlow was a tough taskmaster. You had your portfolio and you had to do what she said and every month Dee Dee would meet with me and we would do this bulletin. Now you have to understand no computers. I, I typed it out then I took it to a guy named Dave Poor on South Campo Road and he made a cutting of it on what do you call those blue sheets you know and then you run them on a drum with ink. Anyway, David did that, then I picked him up, then I had to sort him, then I had to, you know, go to the post office. But I loved it. I loved every moment of it. And then I did a lot of work at Barlow's on King's Highway, where Barlow still lives. The files there. Um, she was just always engaged in what was going on. Wetlands, laws. Uh, land use, um, and as you know, she started the Aspetuck Land Trust all by herself and then got people engaged in it. So I really felt like the League unleashed the intellectual prowess of all of us. We just didn't, you know, women were just so deferent at that time, and um, most of us were. <laughs> anyway, um, it was an organization I would stay with through thick and thin. I would, you know, never leave it. Um, then I became a teacher for 25 years, and so I was less engaged. But before I became a teacher, I used to play tennis with Jackie Hennage. And of course, Jackie was on top of everything, living on Campo Road. They were putting in sewers. They wanted to destroy her beautiful birch tree. I said, Jackie, you've got to join the League of Women Voters. These are people that really zero in on what's going on in this town. And I know you've interviewed a lot of them, but these women were so active and so caring whether, about the space in this town, about the wetlands. Um, 
they were just so knowledgeable and educated. And um, I look back on some of the members. I worked on, um, when my daughter was born 44 years ago, uh, we used to meet here and Fran Cowden was the chairman of this group that was studying One Man, One Vote, which was sponsored by Senator Dirksen in the U.S. Senate. And we met here every week. And, the, you know, it was just so stimulating to be doing something you know, if you're interested in politics, government, if you're interested in your town. And um, I think the League, um, a number of League mem members were uh, responsible for perhaps John Chemish, who was our first selectman, convincing him to have a um, committee, uh, what do you call it? You know, where they look at the char Charter Revision Commission started the charter revision that, that I think that all came about through the league know your town getting the vote out um, just on top of everything and a wonderful organization and a wonderful disparate group of, of women that work together which is I think very important because they tapped into the resources of different people's abilities and go how about people who, other people who you brought into the league once you were in? I know you said Jackie, but were there others? Oh, not, I wasn't, I wasn't as good at that as Carol Agate. And I was hoping that you'd get an interview or I emailed her yesterday, but she's not coming here till August. Um, she was good at that. Um, Selma Bunks, who owns a Bloodroot restaurant in Bridgeport, started unit meetings, which was an entirely new idea where there were three or four me unit meetings that focused on one subject after there was a study. And they made sure there was a night meeting so people could come at night. And we always had night meetings at Florence Sloat's house. Um, I really, I don't think I, re I don't remember who I, re I tried to recruit people as much as possible, but I wasn't as good at it as, uh, as Carol Agate was in our neighborhood. Um, but you know, you, there were, it's interesting, there are certain people that you knew, like you'd say, well, you know, you should join the League of Women Voters, and, and people would say, I'm not political. And I tried to explain to them that we weren't just about politics. We were about studying important items, uh, important issues in our society, whether it was on the local level, the state level, the national level. And um, I always thought there were two kinds of members. There were, or I, sh I should say, two kinds of people that joined. There were the league, people that joined the league and the people that joined the PTA. And when I belonged to the league, we were not anywhere near as active in the food department as at which has evolved you know there were no um brunches and holiday luncheons and stuff like that but we did a lot of other stuff and i felt that this was always a stimulating group of people and that for once you were really you know using your brain and doing uh forums for candidates and trying to get information out so that people make intelligent or you know when they vote that they have information that they're making intelligent decisions based on their own opinions of course um, and and I don't know whether you want me to go into the Women's Caucus of Westport which evolved from this um, and I don't have the exact date but when one day the probably in the late 60s I'm reading Gail Collins' history of the women's movement right now, and I'm keeping a tab of everything she left out, which she's going to get in an email. Um, the National Women's Political Caucus um, appeared on the front page of the New York Times sometime in the late 60s, probably 68 or 69. Gloria Steinem, Flo Kennedy, Bella Abzug, and um, I'm trying to think who the fourth, oh, Shirley Chisholm. And that just was another event that, oh my God, why haven't we done this before? At that time, there was one U.S. Senator, Margaret Chase Smith. There, Bella Abzug was, and Shirley Chisholm, of course, were in the, U, in the House. 
can't think of many more uh, women that were in the house. Often when a husband died, a woman would take the position. So um, I got very excited about that, joined it immediately. And then I said, why don't we start a women's caucus of Westport? Why aren't women engaged in running for public office in Westport? Why is it only the men or if the first selectman happens to appoint a woman? And so I put a little notice in the paper and I would say over 80 women appeared that night. There was, they were parked on the lawn and all over. And the, uh, I was elected chair and a woman by the name of Cynthia Yoder, a Republican, was the co-chair. And there were Republican women that showed up here that used to write the nastiest letters to the paper if there was a majority of Democrats on a board that had been elected. And they showed up and I thought this was sort of a great transformation where women were united. And so um, having worked in public relations in New York, I decided that um, the women who were nominated, um, Pat Copeland, Jackie Hennage, were nominated to run for the Zoning Board of Appeals, got the Democratic Town Committee to uh, interview them and they were willing to run. And um, June Lurie wrote, wrote, ran for the Board of Tax Appeals. Dar Schiller ran for the Board of Ed, but she really wasn't sponsored by the Women's Caucus. You know, we, we pushed Jackie, Pat, June, trying to think if there was anyone else. And I devised an idea of promoting them that rankled everyone in town. I took the women and, you know, and contacted the Rotary, and all the service organizations and promoted them alone. There were maybe five or six, I wish I'd kept the files, maybe five or six candidates. And of course, the men were going crazy. How can you, you know, and in the meantime, they got all this publicity. And um, Jackie and Pat were elected. Dar Schiller was elected because she really was run by the Democratic Town Committee. And that was the beginning of women really getting elected and running for boards. Then John Kemish, who was the selectman, if there was a vacancy, would call me and say, well, who do you think, because you had to have a balance of Republicans and Democrats, who do you think should be on the rec commission if there was a vacancy? So I really feel that we were validated as a group of intelligent people and should, you know, being appointed to commissions. Uh, I, I can't say that, you know, that we were responsible for Julie and Ann Gill or something, but, wait, but we were before this. This preceded that, where, where they were appointed to the P and Z. But it was finally accepted that women could be chairs and run commissions, and they had, many of them did not work, so they had a lot of time to put into these boards and commissions and charter revisions, etc. So it was really a spark of getting women to run. And I really think that the league was responsible, ultimately, what, which I said at the annual meeting last year, for unleashing all of this brain power, all of this women's brain power, because it was just festering there. And there was such a large group of people that were so capable. Virginia Carcher later was on the Board of Finance. I, was, I should have made a list of people. But I mean, she was an economist. She had a master's in economics. Very bright women who had been home. Because in those days, there weren't a lot of women that worked. And... Um, I guess you could afford to live on the salary, the cost of living, but anyway, it was really a terrific, a terrific uh, springboard for women to realize and utilize all of their intellectual abilities. I'm sort of repeating myself. And then um, <clears throat> after we left, the, some of us, well, I went into teaching. I'm not going to go into all that, but some, like Carol went to law school. We were always supportive of the league, but, you know, new people came along. Um, you probably have a list of all the presidents, like Karen Sentner and stuff, and I would, Karen used to sub at my school, so I'd always ask what was going on. And even though I got the, um, 
newsletter, it was very difficult to have a full-time teaching job and two children and, you know, handle all that. Um, I guess that sort of winds up my thoughts about the League. Um, but the thing that was important in those times in the early 70s is that we fought as women. Um, I got this from this um, memo by Robin Morgan, who former editor of Ms. And I mentioned this at the League annual meeting that during this time, um, you know, that we were the women who brought this country equal credit, better pay, affirmative action, the concept of a family focused workplace. We're the women who established rape crisis centers and battery shelters, marital rape and date rape laws. We defended lesbian custody rights. We fought for prison reform. We founded the peace and environmental movements. We insisted that medical research include female anatomy. We inspired men to become more nurturing parents. We created women's studies in Title IX. I remember when it went into the Westport schools. Um, we're the women who reclaim sexuality from violent pornography. I remember there were women who, um, women from now, who um, at the Merritt Superette, they used to have all of the pornographic magazines covered and those women I'm sure Selma could, have you, have you interviewed? Oh. Uh, anyway, there were groups of women that broke off into different vested interest groups to fight for equality. That's all I can call it is equality. And, um, you know, we used to say, what took us so long? I don't, I don't, I, I don't know, but boy, when we, when we took off in the 70s, we really took off. And of course, um, Ella Grasso, when Ella Grasso became governor, the Connecticut Women's Political Caucus, I was on the board of that, we, you know, pressured her to start a commission on the status of women. Ella Grasso was not a feminist, though. Ella Grasso had been in Congress, and she was probably in Congress when Chisholm and Bella Abzug were. Uh, but she did establish that, but again, we had people that we could recommend, and there were two women in New Haven that I worked with very closely. Um, so it may have started all with Susan B. Anthony and the suffragettes, and I feel like we finally picked up the mantle in the late 60s and early 70s, and the League, I really feel, was a catalyst for a lot of what all of us engaged in. And I'm very proud to be a league member for 51 years this year in 2010. That's it. That's terrific.